Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to wait a couple minutes until more folks join. sure what everyone says is we miss seeing you all and hope we'll be able to have some great interaction. I think we're right at 12.02. So um, I'd like to kick off our program, our CRAVE program, um, introduce myself. I'm Jean Nutt, co-managing director of Gensler in Boston and also co-chair for the Real Advantage Committee. And very, very excited about this workshop today, uh, managing change with a coach approach. Uh, Jackie Fowler, director of client services from Elaine Construction will be our moderator. And our speaker, Dr. Joe Hirsch, Managing Director of Samaka Partners. Jackie will give a little introduction um, later so you find out more about Joe. But we're very excited to have him and, and really appreciate him participating. Um, we have a couple of things coming up uh, for August 20th, Supporting Our Children Coffee Hour Discussion. It's part of um, the Cornet Real Advantage uh, sessions with Stephen Dobin, our president, from 9 until 10. Whoops, I think I'm off a little bit. And then, of course, don't forget to join the conversation. Cornet, uh, not only Twitter, but also Instagram, LinkedIn, and any communications you'd like to share, please send them to Stephen Smith at North Star dash press.com. Um, next, we'd like to, of course, thank our corporate partners. Without them, um, programs like this will would be hard to sponsor, as well as our platinum founding circle sponsors and gold founding circle sponsors. Okay, one little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, please note that you can submit questions to the speakers through the Q&A box. And that's important to note that it's not the chat box, it's the Q&A box. Um, Jackie will read through the questions at the end of the presentation. And um, we hope that you guys will send in a lot of questions and create a very lively conversation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jackie where she will give you a little bit more info on Joe. Jackie? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Jean. I'm Jackie Fallow with Elaine Construction, and I'm so excited to introduce um, Dr. Joe Hirsch to you guys here today. Um, Joe is on a mission to transform the way we work at work. He's an international keynote and TEDx speaker, a columnist for Inc., the author of The Feedback Fix, and a contributor to Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and CNBC. Please welcome Joe today. 
Good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to be with you, and I hope everyone is staying safe and well. This is an iPod. It's the most transformative product that Sony Music almost introduced. Now, we know, of course, Sony didn't introduce the iPod. It was Apple, but Sony should have. In the late 1980s, Sony was at the top of the portable music industry. Remember the Walkman? If you still have yours, like I do, go ahead and just let us know in the chat box because we'll use that for uh, assorted comments to the side throughout our presentation. For real Q&A, you'll use the Q&A box as Gene mentioned. And we'll actually take time throughout the presentation to go ahead and take those questions in real time. So this major, major industry, portable music was owned by Sony. And you would have thought that as we turned into a new decade in the 90s, that they would be the ones to be at the forefront of the digital music transformation. As more companies began to realize the power and potential of increasing their digital assets and footprint, Sony should have been the one to create something like an iPod. But something funny happened along the way. In the 1990s at Comdex, the world's largest gathering of consumer electronic producers and consumers, Sony unveiled not one, but two digital music players. There was a music stick and a memory clip, both of which were useful, but competed with one another. Now they had many flaws. They didn't hold enough memory and they were expensive and they weren't necessarily user friendly. But the biggest problem with Sony's rollout at Comdex wasn't hardware, it was human. These two products were so alike that they confused consumers. They roiled investors and they created just the smallest opening for Apple three years later to come into the scene with the iPod. Apple, of course, never looked back. Sony never recovered. And this story actually continues, not here on these shores, but actually across the continent in Moscow. Now, we have here in America our own assumptions and beliefs about Moscow, our own associations. But if you're one of the 12 million people living in Moscow, you know what you probably think of when you think of your country? Dogs. Tons of dogs. In fact, of a city of 12 million people, there are approximately 40,000 stray dogs that roam Moscow's streets. Now, this presents a huge problem for city planners and for the government, but actually, the dogs themselves they've actually figured it out. You see, as uh, sociologists have studied the movements of these dogs over the last three or so decades, they've come to realize that these dogs have actually begun to evolve into four distinct social groups. One of these groups happens to be the guard dogs, the, uh, the dogs that survive by trading services for food. They guard Moscow's many military stations. Others have evolved into a group called the hunters, the ones who go hunt for prey in subway stations and other places. Other groups are scavengers, dumpster divers, the ones that, you know, forage for food throughout Moscow's streets. But the fourth group, the one that has caught the eye of the sociologist and frankly me, is a group called the beggars. And they look something like this. Now, this is not actually photoshopped, friends. <laughs> this is a picture of a beggar dog that is waiting to board the train in Moscow's three station square. That's right. These dogs have developed a morning commute just like we used to have pre-COVID. And using their power of sight and smell, these dogs have managed to survive by learning where to get off and on at different stops to encounter the kind of people that when begged for food will actually give them some. And that's how these dogs have made it. They have figured out what some MBA students only learn at the end of two years, that when it comes to evolving and adapting, you have to cut your losses quickly, you have to pick your winners quickly, and that's exactly what they've learned to do. Now, that's an interesting story, especially for people like me who can't really even find their car in the supermarket parking lot after picking up groceries. I am totally the guy, by the way, 
who blares his car horn to know where he parked because I can't remember where it was. Guilty as charged. But these dogs, aside from developing this uncanny ability to navigate Moscow subway stations, have also developed a very powerful social structure. Because even though some of these dogs have realized that sticking to the old and familiar is what's comfortable, there are others that have evolved in order to survive. The scavenger dogs, sociologists have noted, have over time begun to break from the pack and join the, the beggar group so that they've started to buddy up with them, learn from their behaviors, and in so doing, develop the actual habits that have led to their own survival. Evolve and adapt. If the last few months have taught us anything, it's that the only constant is change. Speed is the variable. And we've all been bracing and racing to confront this change over the last several months, have we not? And now it's no longer enough for organizations to ask the question, how do we respond to change? Because that's a question that looks back. What many organizations, maybe even yours, are asking now is a different question. It's how do we manage change? How do we develop a set of skills and strategies that proactively allow us to get ahead of the change, but more importantly, to do it in a way that pulls people <clears throat> along together rather than keeping them apart. And so today, we're going to ask the following question. What kind of change chimp are you? Because even though change is inevitable and comes faster than ever before, change is hard. And I bet many of you out there are asking yourselves the very same question. I don't know how to handle this change now, and maybe it's making you feel like one of these three chimps. Go ahead and take a moment, if you would, and using the polling feature that's now open, go ahead and let us know what kind of change chimp are you? How are you feeling about the changes that are going on all around you right now as we are now five or six months into these dramatic changes? And I think we need to activate the, uh, the poll there to allow people to go ahead and vote. And once we do, people will have the opportunity to go ahead and tell us how they're feeling about all the changes that are going on right now in their lives. If we're able to activate that poll, great. If not, we can move on because I can tell you I've asked this question to hundreds of people recently, clients, partners, and all of them more or less say the same exact thing. They either feel, they feel threatened, they feel uncomfortable, they feel like they just want to throw their hands up like chimp number C and just give up. And the reality is all of us are feeling in many ways like, like, some, of, like some or all of these chimps. There we go, all right? So it looks like a lot of you here feel like chimp A, some of you like B and, and others like C. And the reality is that if this is how you're feeling about these changes, then how do you think the people around you are experiencing all of that change? It must be difficult. That's the bad news. The good news is that with change, we may not be able to control what happens, but we're always able to dictate what happens next. And so today, we're going to think about how to move from now to next and to start thinking about how we can evolve and adapt, not resist and retreat, how we can adopt more like those dogs in Moscow and not like those engineers at Sony. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we really need to think about three specific ways that we can develop a coach approach because building out this coaching mindset and how it allows us to manage change that comes faster than ever before is based not only on our beliefs, but also on our words and our deeds. And so today, friends, we're going to have a chance to look at three specific ways, three domains of how to build a coach approach to manage all these changes, starting with mindset. And as I said a moment ago, there will be an opportunity to field your questions in real time 
at mile markers throughout the presentation. So please don't hesitate to ask your questions. And in case you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, know that you can ask the questions anonymously. So we encourage everyone to share what's on their mind. And you can use the chat for your ahas, your big discoveries, your wows, or things that you may want to learn even more about. So please make sure to use the chat feature for all of that, your big ideas and your want to learn more about, and use the Q&A for questions that you may have that we can answer at uh, specific points throughout our presentation today. So let's talk about this idea of mindset because ultimately, if we are going to manage with a coach approach, we have to redefine what it means to lead in these times. I was talking to a leader at a financial services company the other day, he's an SVP, and he shared with me a frustration that he feels that leaders now are being asked to do more than they've ever been done, they've ever been asked to do before. And he shared with me, his name is Brian, and he shared with me the frustration that he's feeling that not only is he having to manage the bottom line and KPIs and all the fires that are going on within his team, he now somehow has to make sure that his employees feel engaged and that they're supported from a distance. And, and my heart goes out to leaders during these times. It certainly goes out to employees, but it also goes out to the leaders. Because if you are a leader of a team, you know very well how difficult it is to make sure that you do your job and make sure they feel supported in theirs. So perhaps when you lead with a coach approach, it's not about doing more, but doing different. And that starts the way we see people and even ourselves. Here's a picture you may have seen before. Jackie Falla, you did such a great job introducing. Um, let me ask you, what do you see, Jackie, when you look at this picture? Go ahead and unmute yourself. And my design it. eye sees a vase, and then my communication side sees two people chatting with one another, and it toggles back and forth very quickly. So Jackie is one of those people that sees the whole uh, picture, and so you can actually see two things here. And the reality is that when we have some of these conversations, sometimes we only see one thing right? Sometimes we only see the vase, the most obvious thing in front of us, and we're not attuned to the picture that's creeping along the margins. And that's because we as leaders have a limited view of people and situations. And according to the research, we are famously bad, <laughs> famously bad at understanding other people's perspectives. In fact, when we are actually communicating to other people about their performance, we tend to get it wrong almost two thirds of the time. It's something that in the research is called the idiosyncratic Rader effect. It basically says that when you and I are talking about a situation or when you and I are wrapped up in a performance conversation about your work, I am almost two thirds of the time likely to describe and prioritize the things that matter to me not you, and to filter the whole conversation and the whole encounter through the prism of my own priorities, the idiosyncratic Rader effect. But it's not just my blind spot, it's also my bias. I don't necessarily have a clear view of all of the events. And as a result, things like the recency effect, a, a very famous cognitive bias that we all suffer from, we fall back on instinctively. We tend to think of the most recent events as the most important, and we give more weight to the things that happened more recently. So when we're having a conversation about something that may have happened a quarter ago or a project ago, I'm still thinking and filtering about what's happened in the last couple of days. But this is more than just on the surface level. It really runs deep on a neurobiological level. And this is why it's so important to become aware of what's going on deep inside our neural architecture whenever we attempt to shift our mindset about how we lead. Because the truth is, when we tell people what we're seeing about them, when they feel like their safety is questioned or their status is threatened to side effects of change, they are likely to produce one of three responses, fight, flight, 
or freeze, fight. They become oppositional, they defy, they reject, they push back at your view and version of events. They flight, they take flight, they run away from that uh, conversation or from the facts that are facing them as much as possible. And by the way, that cuts both ways. It's the reason why, according to research, that leaders are reluctant, as we're gonna explore a little bit later on today, to give honest, candid feedback because they themselves are running from these conversations. They don't wanna rock the boat, especially when the boat is rocking like crazy. They don't wanna hurt feelings. And frankly, they don't feel comfortable sharing the news over Zoom or in a phone call or even, uh, or even through chat functions like Slack. So they and the people who report to them are running from these conversations. But worst of all, when we, when we trade in the business of judgments, when we're telling people about what they're doing rather than taking a listen and learn approach to what's happening, there's the response of freeze, literally deer in the headlights. Let me show you what this looks like deep, deep on a neuro level. This is an fMRI scan of a brain in a state of rest. And all the blue you see over there is cortisol. It's the stress inducing hormone that is activated and floods the brain's pathways. Whenever we feel like our safety is challenged, our security is, is uh, threatened, our status is at risk, and in this particular instance, the cortisol levels are relatively low. Maybe if we all hooked ourselves up to fMRI scans right now, here in the middle of a day, enjoying some learning together and growing together, our stress levels might be low too. But when our status is challenged, when our safety is questioned, when we feel like it isn't safe, then the brain starts to flood with cortisol and it looks like this. And this is a picture of a brain on change scared, stressed, and strung out. And it is the reason why so many of these conversations don't go very well from the start. And there's really three that I've identified in combing through the research. And the first is that idea of judgment. It's that when someone is telling us about something we should be doing, when we're managing others and we're just simply telling them what has to be done without inviting dialogue or activating empathy, then people feel like they're in the realm of judgment and no one likes to feel judged. It also signals a sense of helplessness within individuals. Whenever someone feels like he or she is unable to change, unable to do anything about the situation at hand, they are thrust into a state that psychologists call learned helplessness. It's like the mouse that tries to escape the cage and every time it gets to the entrance, it gets zapped and thrust back. Well, after enough zaps, you're gonna stop trying. It's like those beggar dogs, um, they learned over time that if they asked, they would receive. But if they asked and didn't receive, they would finally quit because it's habitual, it's animalistic, it's instinctive to all biology. But worst of all, aside from the judgment and the helplessness, is this feeling of fixedness, what psychologists call fixed mindset. The idea that no matter what I do or or how I try to change, this is who I am. And that tape that has been playing throughout the pandemic of, I was a high performer when I was able to be in the office with others, but now I'm working remote and I feel like I have no idea what's going on. I don't know how to assert myself. I don't know how to lead. I'm not sure how to help people. This is what it is. This is how it's gonna be. There's no daylight. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. And we develop a sense of fixed assumptions about situations and worse people. But the worst problem, my friends, of managing with an outdated view of how people do their best is the issue of time. Because it's very likely that not only are we not describing events with fidelity, people probably aren't recalling them very well either. Neither are we. You may be familiar with something called the forgetting curve. If you learned it once and forgot it, that's okay. The forgetting curve basically holds that there is a sudden and steep loss of retention of, of memory within 24 hours of learning something. So if you, let's say, uh, can't remember a day later what exactly you were supposed to do on that project, you have to go back and look back at the notes. 
it's probably because you didn't rehearse that information in order to retrieve it within the first 24 hours. That's why when we were all in school, the teachers told us, do your homework, review, because if you don't, you'll forget it. They were actually telling the truth. And after 24 hours, that 50% drop, which is very sudden and steep, levels off over the next six days or so, so that by the time you are a week removed from learning that information, you have forgotten almost 90% of that information. Can you imagine what this looks like every day now, especially as it's been amplified by the distance that we are all now experiencing? Individuals are having a harder time keeping track of things, and that's frankly, biological. So leaders can't necessarily fall back on the assumption that they know better or that people are even remembering because those are two deep-seated biological forces that are working against us every single day. If all of this is humming in the background, you can expect that most people in this new environment are operating in a climate of fear and not safety. And research tells us very clearly that psychologically safe environments places where people feel like they can be themselves, where they can actually raise issues in the forefront without fear of repercussion or reprimand. Those are the environments that are better producing, that are higher performing, ultimately that are better retaining and help people become the very best versions of themselves. So the first thing we need to look at here today is how to shift the dial from fear to safety. And to do that, it really comes back to this mindset shift that I hope we'll consider today. And to me, it comes down to the difference between being what I call a window gazer or a mirror holder. Window gazers, they tell you what they see. Those are the two people, like if Jackie and I were staring at the picture before, and Jackie said, I see a vase. And I say, I see two people looking at each other uh, at a profile. So we're both right. But if Jackie is my boss, and she holds the power, then she holds the perspective because her view and her version of events is the only one that counts. When you're window gazing as a leader, you may be authorized to share a view, but it may not be one that is complete. You may not have all the facts. Like we said, you're, we're all famously bad at understanding other people's perspective with all the other biases and cognitive traps that get in our way. What if instead of window gazing and telling people what we see, we adopted a view called mirror holding and held that mirror up to others as leaders to not force a view, but provoke an insight. To not just tell people what we see, but to help them see things more clearly for themselves. And this is not some theory. This is something that I personally experienced in one of my early jobs. I was completely unaware of how I was showing up to other people. And it was only when a good friend told me, how do you want to appear to other people? Because the way that you are showing up or the way you think you're showing up is not how others are perceiving you. Was I actually able to take a hard look and see myself in a whole new way? And if we're honest with ourselves, we might all be doing a better job of mirror holding, right? Think for a moment, and I'll give you just 10 seconds to reflect, but where you stand on the scale. You don't have to actually share that in the chat, but I'm curious where you stand. Initially, I was probably closer to a four early on in my career. I think I've gotten better with help from others and with a very intentional and reflective stance. I think I'm closer to a 10, I'm definitely not a 10, but I'm definitely not a four. Where do you stand right now? And where could you be standing in this post-pandemic reality when your employees need you to be mirror holding more than ever before? And if we take that closer look at where we stand on that spectrum, we might actually be able to support people the way that we want to. But it's not simply about the mindset that we bring. That mindset also has to shape the way that we interact with others. And so I want to share with you uh, a trusted, simple tool that I think anyone is capable of doing with minimal practice. Obviously, with time, you'll get better at it. And it's called a feed-forward interview. It's rooted in the uh, research-based principle of appreciative inquiry. AI, not 
the one that's going to make us all robots. But that other AI, appreciative inquiry, uh, it, it's rooted in the idea that when we reflect on our success, our past success, but do so in the wider context of collective contribution of who and what has helped us along the way, we are better able to replicate success again over time. So this could be a tool that you use alongside existing performance conversations. It could be something as informal as a coffee date with uh, someone on your team, a coffee uh, you know, get together. It could be something that you build informally to your management and evaluation systems. And it goes like this. Because performance is a journey, right? we're always on the path. I think of this conversation unfolding in three stages, like a journey, starting with the summit. The summit is where we talk about people's and help people uh, retrieve their very best selves, the, the summit of their performance. And as you can see here, these are some what I call hero questions that you can ask people on your team to help them retrieve and activate that sense of success that they experienced. Maybe it was a win on the last project. Maybe they over-delivered. Maybe they felt like they came alive in their work. It had nothing to do with the project, but there was something that just, I don't know, clicked or felt different over the last few weeks. And when you ask people about this, your job isn't to tell and sell. It's to listen and learn. Because telling and selling, that's the, the window gazing. Anybody can tell and sell, and leaders do a lot of that. We're very good at telling and selling. Listening and learning, that's the opportunity of mirror holding. And so starting to ask these questions will activate people's sense of accomplishments, their strengths. And from there, you ask an, a, a following set of questions, the trek, because with appreciative inquiry, it's never about the heroic journey. It's always about the ensemble, because very rarely, if ever, in life. Do we ever achieve something all by ourselves? It's always, always with someone or something standing by our side. So ask the person who or what helped you along this way. As the coach in this conversation, your job again is to listen and learn, not to tell and sell, and to try to gather as much information as possible about the conditions that led to that moment of peak, to that summit. We're not talking about a forensic conversation. You don't have to go way back deep into their psychology. These are quick, casual conversations to try to help people activate their best self and then to trace the steps, the conditions that allowed them to feel that way. And once they do that with your support, here's the most important part of the feed forward interview. And it's the climb. Because doing something once, it's a moment but doing it again and again, that's a habit. And habits are powerful, moments are fleeting. And with these habits, you can help build again and again, a scaled version of success to help people reflect and replicate those best moments that they experienced with the help of others. Summit, trek, and climb, those are the three steps of the feed forward interview. And actually, just because I've been feeling very generous over these last few months, I think the generosity, according to research, is the way to deal with adversity. It's very, very powerful. And for me, it's actually been a great way to overcome the hardships uh, of these past several months. As a, a, just something that I wanna share with you today, prepared for you a set of resources, including uh, ways for you to learn more about and begin to practice using the feed forward interview. If you go to my website, it's a page that I dedicated just to you. Um, no one else in the world will know about it except our friends here at Coronet. And so uh, later on today, you can jump on there. And by the way, if it's okay with you, I'll share these resources out with you as well. So we don't have to distract from the learning that we're gonna continue to do together. That's all about mindset. Jackie, were there any questions in the Q&A that you think would be helpful to address right now? There aren't any questions right at this moment, but I do encourage again for people to filter on some, some questions into us. We're happy to Ab answer them. Absolutely. And so uh, thank you, uh, Jackie. We'll come back to you a little bit later to see if anyone else has anything on their minds. So that's all mindset, but what about message? 
because it's helpful to talk about long-term growth and long-term priorities and, and for leaders to shift the way they think about their roles and the people that they are supporting. But let's all be honest, that doesn't help you in the day-to-day -day grind when there is a real conversation that has to take place right now, right here. So what can you do to manage with a coach approach these real time, right now conversations that have to take place when something unfortunately is not going well. Now, if you're like most people, when you oh, have to deal with the- I, I, did, I did just get a question. Okay. Can I share it with you and, and get your thoughts? Absolutely. Before we move on to the second part, um, how do you recommend seeking out feedback? That's a great question. And actually, this actually, this actually, hopefully, what we're about to discuss will answer that very question. So Super. most people, when they give feedback, do so with a praise sandwich. The compliment, followed by a critique, followed by another compliment. And I just want to be clear, I don't have a problem with praise. I think praise is a powerful tool. I praise my children based on the, the work that they're doing. Um, on their process. The problem with the praise sandwich isn't really the praise, it's the sandwich. <laughs> because the research is pretty clear about what's actually happening when you share the praise sandwich. You know, you do so out of a desire to soften the blow, to maybe not rock the boat that we talked about before, not to activate all the stress, your brain on change like we talked about before. But friends, if this is how you're giving feedback, do you know what most people are focused on in a prey sandwich? That, <laughs> the criticism that's smacked in the middle of that sandwich. And going back to the recency effect that we just talked about a little bit earlier, people tend to focus on the most recent things that they hear. So whereas you think you have successfully checked the box and have delivered the critique or shared the news that has to be shared, most people, most of the time, are not hearing that message. Jackie and I were talking offline before uh, we got together today about a situation that uh, she, she became aware of um, on the job. And it's one that I, I don't know that anyone has actually ever experienced. It was, out, it was like a pretty outrageous story, Jackie. Um, and, and if it's okay with you, I'll, can I share it with everyone? Absolutely. Okay, so, so Jackie shared with me um, a, a situation where uh, a, a contractor was going to demo some concrete in order to create an interconnected uh, bridge between parts of the building. And they were gonna demo the, the concrete. And in order to soften the blow, uh, they proposed putting out 15 foot uh, tires to absorb all that fallen concrete. I don't know about you guys, but that to me doesn't seem like the world's greatest idea. Now, at the time, uh, I guess the, uh, the project executive on the account had a, had a choice to make. He or she could have said, that's it, we're firing the sub, we're moving on, we're gonna get someone else, but that would waste time, that would derail the project, it wouldn't be great for the, uh, for, for the client. So instead they had an honest, candid conversation about what, actually could happen. And maybe we'll rephrase and reframe that conversation as I show you an alternative to the praise sandwich, which doesn't always land very well. And that's effort to help move from chaos, the confusion, to clarity with a feedback wrap. So if the praise sandwich isn't getting it done for you, maybe the wrap will. And here's what the wrap stands for. It's a four part sequence that allows us to have more candid, caring, collaborative conversations with the people all around us in real time without hurting feelings and ultimately getting what we want by giving others what they need. So the wrap starts with the W, the what and the where. What's happening and where is it happening? So back to our friend who's going to drop um, a huge slab of concrete onto the floor, onto tires. So you might say to the person, um, John, uh, can we talk about the plan uh, to demo the existing floor and use uh, tires to absorb all the demo, all the debris? You're giving a specific location, uh, a destination, if you will, 
to the conversation. John is not now worried about cost. John is not worried about um, the, the actual timeline or sequence. John knows where you stand. It is specifically about the plan to uh, clear away all this debris by catching it on tires. You tell them exactly what's happening and where it's happening. Most people, when they enter into feedback conversations, they don't necessarily give that destination. They simply say, can I give you some feedback? Well, that could be anything. And in that moment, when we hear that question, our brains instinctively start racing and bracing for what's coming next. There's the cortisol, there's the stress, there's the brain on feedback and change. As we feel like we are about to be forced to change something about ourselves. What and where, give it a destination. From there, talk about the reason for why you're giving this feedback. In John's case, it would be, you know, I have concerns about the safety and the structural integrity uh, of the building if we use the tires. And you might give some actual data points to support that. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Joe, we're adults. We don't have to explain the reason for things. It should be understood. It's obvious. That's what they did you know, in school. They told us all the reason why. And I have to be honest with you, based on the research, I think we can all be doing a little bit more reason and rationale giving. Uh, in our conversations, because a lot of people are unaware of how they're showing up to others. According to one research study, as much as 90% of the population has a self-awareness of about 10%, which is an astounding statistic. It means that most of us go through life not knowing how we're showing up. I was part of that 90%. Uh, I, I certainly wasn't aware how I was showing up to others until someone was a mirror holder and helped me see how I was showing up to others. And that's exactly why telling people about the reason for things helps so much. So give it a destination and give the reason. From there, the feedback wrap moves to the affect. And here's the real differentiator between this and other kinds of feedback that you may have been giving or may rely on from time to time. People can judge us for what we say but they can't argue with how we feel. So by moving these conversations out of the realm of judgment and into the realm of emotion, I don't mean in like a therapeutic sense, I mean in the how this caused me to feel, what feelings and emotions did this engender within me, you're better able to deescalate the tension and create receptivity among others. So if I went back to John and I said, look, I felt when I saw this plan, I felt concerned because of the structural integrity and how this might be perceived by the client. And I don't want to have to go to the, to the, to the client and actually present this view because I'm concerned about how he or she might take to it. And now you've moved it out of the realm of you and into the realm of I. It's no longer, John, what are you thinking? Tires? <laughs> to, I have concerns about this and that small but significant shift makes all the difference in the world. Finally, another differentiator with this approach, the prompt. Rather than telling and selling and being a window gazer, ask the other person what he or she would do next. Having this information, knowing where it is and what's happening, uh, knowing the reason for why you raised it, describing the emotions that it engendered, ask them for their next best step. Now, some people may push back. Like we said, some people just are defensive by nature and will argue with you no matter what you try to do. Those people, you can't necessarily change. But for the vast majority of others, it's amazing to see what happens when they feel like they've reclaimed some control and say and, and voice and choice in this process. What and where, reason, affect, prompt. The feedback wrap allows people to have these candid conversations from a place of caring because you say, look, I'm telling you about this because I care about you. I'm describing the way it's making me feel. I, I want you to know where I'm at. I want to know where you're at. What do you think? And a lot of the times the proposal that is made by the other party is the one that you would have said anyways. Feedback wraps tend to be way more authentic. They are received with greater authenticity. They are focused on affect rather than judgment. They hit the issue straight away. They don't dance around it or dodge it. And ultimately they lead to actionable steps that allow individuals 
to do the very best work that they can possibly do. That's the message. And at this point, we have covered both the mindset shift that individuals can take, that they can adjust the way they think about others and the way they see them by changing their view from window gazing to mirror holding, from telling and selling to listening and learning. And we've talked about a strategic, two strategic approaches about how to do that, the feed forward interview for long-term progress tracking and the feedback wrap for right now must have conversations. Jackie, how about that Q&A? Anything else percolating? No, there isn't uh, any questions right now, but I had one, Joe. Please. Now, I have experienced situations where I'm receiving feedback um, that does put me in that panic state that, that you were talking about. I definitely feel the stress hormones flooding through my body. Is there a way that I can manipulate this approach to get the feedback to change when it's coming to me? Mm. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I wonder if you hacked my brain just now, <laughs> because that's actually where we're headed next, about things that not only the leaders can do to help manage the coach approach, but things that we might ev be able to do ourselves to make ourselves more coachable so that together this becomes a true performance partnership rather than a hierarchy. So with your permission, Jackie, I think we'll attack that uh, right now um, with your permission. Super, thank you. All right, so this brings us everyone to methods and we've talked about two so far, but I wanna, like Jackie just raised, I wanna shift the conversation not just from um, things that leaders drive, leader-driven behaviors, but things that could also, with the right amount of work, things that we all can do, especially as leaders who maybe report up to others, that we can do to make ourselves more coachable or that we can do to help create uh, a certain culture within our workplaces where others feel like they can have the permission and the power to shift these dynamics as well. And this is a really key shift in our third and final uh, domain of managing with a coach approach, of moving from a position of power, which is what we as leaders are accustomed to operating with, to one of partnership. Because ultimately, when we go through these moments of tremendous upheaval, like we are all experiencing right now, it's very lonesome, it's very frustrating, and ultimately it's not very durable unless we can do it together with others. If we want them to be part of the change, they have to be part of the process. And that's why operating with a partnership approach is critical to developing your coach approach to managing all this change. You look at this picture here and most people, when they think about what it takes to create a trusting environment, most people think about the individual who takes that leap of faith, that, that individual who is just going to jump off that platform. Maybe sometimes you think about the people below him or her. Is there a supporting cast? Do people rely on one another? Do they show up for one another? And those are absolutely critical components of a high trust work environment. People who feel like they can take the leap and people who feel like there are others who will catch them when they fall. But there's Another party here that I feel like is often overlooked, and it's that invisible hand that is nudging or pushing us all to take those risks, and that's the leader. <laughs> that's you who are out there on the platform trying to help your organizations evolve and adapt in these very tumultuous times. So what are the behaviors that you as the leader can do to help individuals feel comfortable taking that leap? And what can you do to make sure that there are people there to catch others when they feel like they're falling? I've identified in my own work three particular areas that allow us all to develop a greater sense of coachability, whether that's you managing up with your own boss or you creating the conditions that allow others uh, to do the same. And the first is this idea that Jackie raised about asking for feedback. Uh, 
Herman Miller is a great example of this. I think we may even have some folks from Herman Miller on with us today. And when Herman Miller wanted to design new hospital chairs a few years ago, they actually, instead of just leaving it to their design team, they conducted a series of listening tours, a listening interview with 19 different hospitals in the area, patients, providers, to try to design a chair that wasn't just ergonomically uh, excellent, but one that really accounted for real everyday patient concerns. And that voice of the patient, that empathy, that asking for feedback made all the difference in how that product was rolled out. And when we think about how we can design the best versions of ourselves, our best product, it comes not necessarily from the feedback that we receive that trickles down, it's the feedback that we ask for. And frankly, if we are comfortable asking for feedback and getting comfortable with that, then it's gonna to come to us when we need it and in the time when it's needed most. It's also about developing a greater tolerance for mistakes. Right now, I don't know about you, but I feel like in my work with leadership teams, I'm hearing a lot of the same thing and that it's so important now. Leaders are voicing um, a, very, a very real, very raw uh, belief that while they may not have been the most accepting and accommodating about mistakes in the past, COVID-19 and the resulting changes that have occurred have forced them to be more tolerant, more accepting, and frankly, more embracing of mistakes. And there's a wonderful quote that I want to share with you from Ed Catmull, he used to be the head of uh, Disney Pixar, part of the creative team, um, who I profile in the Feedback Fix. And he says something about trust that is so powerful. It's, it's not the belief that people won't screw up, because they will. <laughs> trust is is emerging in the moments when they do screw up. It's believing in others that even when things don't go right, you can still help them correct course. And this belief in other people is one that animates the work that Disney Pixar does, especially when they're creating storyboards for new movies. So when they just released a great example that uh, one of their creative directors told me is that when uh, Toy Story 4 came out uh, last summer, the early stages of development when they do storyboarding and they lay out all the scenes. So they come every so often after every, uh, I think after every scene is complete, they come to these crit sessions where all the creatives come together, all the uh, storyboard um, animators, and they share their work. And the one rule that they have at Pixar is you can't knock down someone's idea unless you have another way for them to do it better. They call that plussing because they raise the idea count up, not down. And if we all did a little more plussing with the mistakes that people were making, then maybe we would also be raising the idea quotient and the feeling of security and safety in our own workplaces. So asking for feedback is important and tolerating mistakes is certainly important. These are ways to build trust, but it ultimately comes down to trying to understand as much as we can about others in the process. And a great example of an organization that in its essence is predicated on the idea of learning as much as they can of becoming learn-it-alls instead of know-it-alls is WD-40. Gary Ridge, the CEO, uh, has this beautiful, um, be beautiful pledge that all leaders must take uh, when they assume leadership duties. You can go ahead and read it there. But what all the leaders are doing is essentially saying, I am the one who is responsible for taking action, getting the information, sharing that information, letting others know about it in the right time, and never getting offended that I didn't have it right away or when I thought I needed it. Because being a learn-it-all is ultimately about being responsible for your behaviors and your beliefs. Because leaders get the organizations that they deserve. And ultimately, when leaders make that leap to become more trusting, they signal something very powerful. Look, if you try and you trust your team and they fail, you've gained an insight. But if you never try, if you fail to try, then you've lost an opportunity. You've lost an opportunity to learn as much as you can about the people all around you.
And so today we started to develop a three-part approach to what it means to manage change with this coach approach. How to move from fear to safety by adopting a new mindset, mindset of window gazing, uh, of mirror holding and not window gazing. How you start enlarging the view of other people rather than focusing on your own. How to shift from chaos to clarity, how you can use a feedback wrap to help shape these conversations in real time in a way that is candid, compassionate, caring, and ultimately collaborative. And finally, to move the dynamics from power to partnership, to start operating with the assumption that yes, it is you who breeds trust, who makes it possible for others to feel safe, to feel heard, to feel like they have a voice in what's going on, and ultimately to feel responsible for making sure that they are in charge of making sure that the organization is doing what needs to be done in the time that it needs to be done. Again, I, I'm very happy to share some more resources about this, some relevant reads, some additional research, and uh, reflective exercises that you can absolutely uh, use with your teams or just on your own. Um, and that's all available to you at uh, joehirsch.me slash cornet. I want to uh, leave you with this one thought as we, uh, as we conclude our time together today. Take a look at one more image because life is all about seeing things a different way. And for the companies that have uh, really been successful in navigating change, the ones that I've observed close, like firsthand, the ones that are adapting well are the ones that are able to see things differently. So when you look at this picture here, what do you see? Jackie, I'm gonna ask you again, one more time, since you did a great job last time. What do you see, Jackie? I see a very intricately, intricately detailed panel system. Great, okay, so lots of squares. Yes. And that's something that most people would see as well. But if you look a little closer, do you see circles? Yes. Okay. They were there all along. We just never saw them. Really? And that, my friends, is what I want to leave you with today. And that is how we manage these very difficult times ultimately comes down to having and developing a coach approach from shifting the dynamics, from fear to safety, from chaos to clarity, from power to partnership, if we're brave enough and bold enough to start developing a coach approach, to use the set of skills that we talked about today, or to learn others that I can share with you maybe at a different time, then we will do three big things. We will deliver better products, we will encourage better people, and ultimately, we will build better versions of ourselves. I wanna thank all of you today for the opportunity to learn alongside you. I hope that today's session gave you things to think about, things to practice, and a way to move forward with confidence and clarity, and ultimately compassion and collaboration. I'm going to kick it back over to Jean, who's gonna take us home. Thank you. Thank I'm Thank not going to let Jean take it away quite yet, or you get out of the hot seat quite yet, because... Do we have we other do, questions? We do have some other questions. All right, let's do it. Um, so one is, what happens um, if you ask for actionable items from your boss, and they insist that there's only one way of doing things? Is there a way to work through that conversation to be able to look at other possibilities? Uh, Krista is interested in knowing this. It's a great question, Krista. And one thing that I would recommend that I've seen to be very helpful is to actually turn this, con this approach on to the boss and to say, that's a really great suggestion and I understand why you're saying it. What do you think about this alternative? Here's what I was thinking and to state your, you know, your, your what and where, here's what I was thinking and where I would do it. Here's the reason for why I was thinking about it. <clears throat> here's why I feel like it could be helpful, you know, uh, and ultimately what are your thoughts? And the boss can come back and say no, but at least now you know where he or she stands as opposed to always wondering, you know, is that the only thing that I have? Is that the only option available? And instead of just taking that suggestion uh, as, as truth to, to raise other possibilities that 
may even be better off for both of you in the long run. That, that's wonderful. Um, I think that that's all we have for right Great. now. And I know that we're no out of time. Jean, so I'll turn nope. it perfect timing, perfect timing. Thank you so much, um, Jackie, for introducing us to Joe and Joe for an amazing presentation, leaving us with a lot to think about. And thanks to everybody who was able to participate. And um, I'm sure I'm supposed to remind everybody that a survey will be coming out. We really appreciate it if you guys would respond and enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you again on our next Crave series. Take care, everybody.